Fireside Chat Podcast, episode number four, recorded February 12th, 2013. Jerome McGinley's contract is like a newborn baby to a high school mother. Wait, what? Episode four. We're back. I can't believe we're on our fourth episode already. It's me, Dan, alongside Matt and Lucas, as usual. How you guys doing? Good. I'm lovely. Excellent. Before we get started tonight, we need to let people know where they can find us online. Uh, you, you can always find Fireside Chat, not only the podcast, but great articles that Matt has been writing um, at firesidechat.ca. And there you'll find all the podcasts, the current episode, the previous episodes. You'll find the latest Flames news and short-form articles and all sorts of really good stuff. And Fireside Chat is also wherever you are online. If you're on Twitter, you can follow us at Fireside Podcast. If you're on Facebook or Google+, Plus, you can also find us there. Just search for Fireside Chat. So with the plug over, let's get to talking about the Flames. So how did you guys think about the last week of Flames games? Could be better. Um, I was remarkably unsurprised by everything. Uh, Irving, you know, got a win, and then, um, or how, oh, God damn, how many wins does he have? I've, I'm completely one, blank. one and okay, one. Okay, one, one, and one. So yeah, that's about as reasonable as uh, one could expect. And in each of his games, I mean. I don't fault him at all for the Vancouver game because if I had, you know, we've all seen Kiprasov get blown out by the Canucks in the last eight years on multiple occasions. Uh, so, I mean, considering the kind of saves he made and, you know, he did everything he could to keep the team in it, you know, no no complaints on uh, on that end, but, you know, as far as points... No, no, as far as uh, as far as points, all I'm saying is, uh, you know, three points out of our last slate of games was not, uh, I guess, unexpected. I was just going to say, we last got together on Tuesday, the 5th, which was right after the Detroit game, which was a 4-1 to win, and we were all quite high on the team after that. It felt good to beat the Wings 4-1, and then after that, they went on to... A 4-3 win against the Blue Jackets. I think everybody expected, expected a win against the Blue Jackets. Uh, the 5-1 to one loss against the Canucks, where this team really just fell apart. And then I thought they came back and did not too bad against the Wild to be able to force the uh, the shootout in that one. So overall, I think we've we've done pretty good this last week. Well, on the... Well, for Irving, he's actually done pretty well. It, it's all about expectations. Like, if you're expecting him to be, like, Kipper's replacement and equal, that's not feasible. But, you know, I think from how he's been playing, he could be a solid, like, Chris Mason. Not a good starting goalie, but, you know gives you a chance to win and certainly he wasn't at fault in either the Vancouver or the Minnesota game for losing the team it seems uh, to be falling into some bad habits from last year where they were getting too far away from the defense the forwards and you know just uncoordinated um to jump in on Irving, I mean, he gave his ch- his team a chance to win every single game, even even the Vancouver game, which was a five one blowout. As I said, not really his fault. Um, I think if nothing else, like you want to believe that as a first round goalie, he can be your you know goalie of the future. And I think it's pretty not not pretty evident, but I think it's. We're on the road to confirming that he isn't going to be a number one in this league, but I think at the very least, these last uh, three games have uh, really indicated that he deserves more starts as the backup. He's a he's a competent backup, if nothing else. Um, he should he, he's more than capable of handling fifteen or twenty games, and honestly, for a team that's been looking for a backup goalie as long as we have. You know what? We may have found him. 
Yeah, and how would you say with Irving, if Kipper is out for a long time and that, he he should be able to get more confidence in himself. And, you know, anytime a goalie gets more playing time, they start to do better. So, you know, I think right now he's uh, doing a very good job as a backup. But I do see in how he's playing that there is the potential that he could be a middle of the road to low end starter in the future. Yeah, I I, I yeah. agree. He's I don't think he's ever a guy you're gonna win. Even he might win a playoff round if he catches lightning in a bottle, but I don't think he's necessarily going to be. Again, a bona fide, you know, sixty-plus game guy. But you know, you don't have to have. That. You know, if you have two goalies who can start forty games comfortably, I don't know. Yeah, that's good. Well, well yeah, you know, it's if, not ideal. It, but. The, well, the thing is, is that it, he's more or less a starting caliber goalie on a bad team. So, like a Columbus Blue Jackets level team. So or us. <laughs> yeah <laughs> like I think we need to uh, we, we really need to realize that as much as we think we should be beating the Blue Jackets our level of team is that bottom 10 team at the moment and until the team proves otherwise we can delude ourselves all we want but Leland Irving would be a starter for a team like us as I've watched Irving over the years through the various different farm teams the Flames have had him play in, um, I've always thought, you know, if this guy could turn out to be a Scott Clemenson type, a guy who is going to get a job every year, and he's not going to play a lot of games. I mean, Clemenson backed up Brodeur and hardly ever played some years, but he was always seen as a steady enough goalie to get a job. I thought that would be a good role for Leland to mature into. Yeah, yeah, that'd be that'd be great. I mean, well, not great. It, it would be a rel- It would be a success relative to every other Daryl Sutter first rounder not named Fanuf. Well, plus, like, if the Flames are going to eventually go into a rebuild, we have a couple of decent goalie prospects out there. So that if Irving just holds the job down. You know, you can let the other guys like Brassois and uh, Jillies to get more experience, like uh, how Irving has in Abbotsford, to, you know, develop. Then, you know, you might get someone that is a legitimate replacement for Kipper, but it might not necessarily be him. Well, here is a question for you. Who... Out of our goalie prospects, do you think is the most likely to become an NHL starter? Gillies. I actually think he might end up being a star goalie because of his height. So I, I'd agree with that. He's uh, everything in the brief things that I've actually seen him play in. He looks, he looks like a stud. There's a while this organization was really high on Ordeo, and he seems to have just fizzled. I don't hear much about him anymore. Well, he's doing good in Finland right now, but again, it's Finland, which is quite inferior even to the Swedish Elite League, so, yeah, that's not, that. you know, it's like having a star goalie in the ECHL. You can't really tell. <laughs> Well, I mean, Ortio, I mean, he didn't stick in the AHL either last year or two years ago. They didn't even bother bringing him over this time around. I mean, maybe he's just a late developing goalie, but in all honesty, he's probably just a guy who, you know, they took a flyer on in the sixth round because Kiprasov trained with him. And, I mean, I'd love to be proven wrong with any prospect I doubt, but, you know, He's as much a he seems as much a favor pick as anything, and you know if he doesn't pan out, he doesn't pan out. No harm, no foul. Yeah. Anytime a sixth rounder busts, who really notices? And you don't even you really call it a bust in the sixth round? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, who cares? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think in the sixth round it's kind of par for the course. But while we're talking about goalies, why don't we talk about the newest flame, Joey McDonald, who was brought in? Um, off waivers from Detroit. 
What do you guys think of that pickup? I think he's a pretty solid goalie. He's not going to blow you away. I did see him a couple of times when he played with the Islanders, and okay, as a backup, you know, nothing to write home about. He'll give you a chance to win. Not much more you can ask from a backup, really. But probably a better better choice than uh, Danny Taylor? Yeah, uh, just because uh, from what I read online, the, the Flames were a little concerned with how Taylor was performing in practice because he didn't seem quite ready for NHL caliber slap shots. So, you know, that's not good. <laughs> oh my god, Danny, T- or not Danny Taylor, um, Joey McDonald at one time was a Halifax Moosehead. And uh, I've, I'm originally from Halifax. Uh, he played 17 games and went 3-12. and in what would have probably been his 16-year-old season, so no real worries there. But that being said, in the NHL, he's got two more years on the planet than he does NHL wins, which is still better than most of our usual backups. But, I mean, it, once Kiprasov, knock on wood, gets healthy and... Uh, you know, assuming he's around no, and not traded, uh, I would expect to see Joey McDonald right back on waivers. Um, this is the time to evaluate Leland Irving as an NHL goalie, see what he can really give you. And Joey McDonald's here to, I don't know, hold down the fort. Again, in, a, in an emergency, he's a better emergency option than Danny Taylor. Yeah, and you know, last week, last week we talked about if the Flames might sign a UFA goalie, and I think that by bringing in Joey McDonald, who's you know 33 years old and has 101 NHL games under his belt, he's a seasoned goalie, and I think that almost does the same thing as it would have bringing in that UFA veteran just for insurance to make sure you've got a guy who knows the NHL game. Well, plus the acquisition cost was nothing other than like the waiver cost, so big deal. Worst case scenario, you just dump him back on waivers when everybody's healthy and carry on. <laughs> yeah, he's on a one-year deal too, so even if we have to keep the contract till the end of the year... It doesn't really no affect deal. anything. So Matt, you were mentioning earlier that you're starting to see some mistakes that we saw last year creeping back into this team. What are you seeing that's alarming? Well, in the um, Minnesota game yesterday, one thing that I noticed that they were having difficulties initially getting their normal game plan going and then the forwards started especially in the second period they started pushing up further in their own zone and leaving the zone and hanging out at center ice while the the defensemen were having it in our end and that gap control that was prevalent in the first 10 eight games I mean uh, that seemed to go away and that actually ended up leading to the Minnesota goal because uh, the forwards were already outside the blue line when they the defenseman turned it over and then there was a 2 on 0 right in front of Irving and there was nothing he could do about that so if they're more <sighs> focused on their how they are in relation to each other that that gives them more chance to be successful and they were getting away from that especially in the vancouver game i noticed that too do you think that possibly that the reason our forwards cheat so much has to do with in part due to the fact that they're just not that fast i mean there's at a certain point it's not you che- it's not you cheating because you're selfish it's you cheating because you know that you can't outrun defenders from well, a well, similar position well how would you say they don't really need to outrun the other team though cuz you know most teams employ a version of the trap so everybody gets slowed down at the blue line anyway and like that's why most teams dump it in but if unless you got a guy like Matthew Lombardi who can just fly that really isn't an issue so it's just creating a little defensive weakness which can lead to more turnovers and 
that's where the problem is. But is it not more of a, I guess, a possibility considering all of our top players are uh, well on the Average wrong side of worse. well on the wrong side of thirty? <laughs> yeah. Well, yes and no because of the fact that it it would be one thing if, say, like again, Lo was just cheating up. But, like, in the second period, it was every line, and they were all three of the players were up. And it was hard for the defensemen to actually make a pass because they'd have two people in the way. And, you know, unless you just fire it up trying to dump the puck down the ice, there's not really any options. Normally, like, when they were closer the center would be really close to the defenseman and the wingers would be slightly up more like a a five on a dice so you know and they have been pushing that further up and you know it's just leading to some discohesion in the team well if you were going to fly all three forwards from the zone anyway why wouldn't you at least attempt some strategic icings and just try and win a race well they do how many do guys that, on this though. team do you think could win a race and that if you basically have como and maybe blair jones that could do that and that's it <laughs> so yeah it just seems like a bad strategy, especially when having the defensemen being able to pinch in, you know, if the they don't have, if they're, the forwards and the defensemen are too far apart, the defense can't pinch in and join the rush because there's just too much space there. So what was being successful having Brody and Bowmeister jump into the play, that's not as available if they're too far away. Fair enough. Good good analysis. So talking about mistakes and poor decision making and that sort of thing, um, before the show we talked a little bit about specifically Giordano making some poor decisions. Well, a couple of times in the Minnesota game, I, he had the puck and he wasn't being pressured. Like, it, both times there was... Nobody, no wild player within like 20 feet of him. And instead of just taking a chill pill and looking and seeing what his options were, he rushed the play and just like shot the puck around the boards both times. And it ended up getting picked off. Both times, I do believe, were on the power play. And he didn't need to rush at all there. And yeah, he hasn't really seemed to be himself since he got injured last year. I'd uh, I'd agree with that for sure. I mean, I don't know why he bothered to rush back as quickly as he did. I mean, I know he's a competitor, but I mean, we I don't know if necessarily he wasn't fully healed, but I mean, he had a detached tendon or whatever it was, and that I, I'm not a doctor, but that sounds severe. That sounds like you need more time off to heal from it than he took. And I know we're in the age where you know, Ray Lewis comes back from a torn tricep muscle in eight weeks, but um, it really seems like a detached uh, tendon in your quad or wherever it was, maybe you want to take four or five months and just get that right. But regardless of his injury situation, his offensive awareness has been, is just his awareness in general uh, has been subpar. He is not the same composed player that earned him that uh, that earned that twenty million dollar contract. Yeah, well, he. How would you say my expectations of him and Weidman? It seems like how Weidman's doing is what I expected from Giordano, and vice versa. <laughs> so I mean, you're right. Like, remember when Weidman was signed? All the people coming out of the woodwork saying, you know, oh, he's a pylon, he's bad defensively, blah blah. blah. Has I mean, uh, he may not be, you know, a 31 year old Chris Pronger, but has Weidman really upset you with his defensive coverage? No, him and Brody have actually been. Probably the best defense pairing we've had, we've got, and in both ends of the ice, they've been really solid. Yeah, 
things go both ways. Sometimes we get highly touted defensemen like Jay Bowmeister who come here and do disappoint. So for every one that's going to disappoint us, we need to have one that's going to really impress us. I, I do have to say that uh, I cannot remember a, a Flames season in recent memory where all of our acquisitions have been so universally unhated. I mean, Hoodler, Cervenka, uh, uh, Weidman, like, they're all... Do you think it's the decisions themselves, or do you think it's the guy making the decisions? I actually think... I think Feaster has done a really good job thus far, both uh, with his additions in the management side and drafting, and now we're even seeing it with the free agent signings. He seems like he actually has a long-term plan for this team, not like uh, the Sutters yes. who would just go up there and do whatever felt right the moment they walked on stage. But I still think that if Daryl would have done some of these same uh, acquisitions or some of these same trades, he would have got blasted for them just because it was Daryl Sutter. Yeah. I don't think so. I think Daryl had a ton of, uh, a ton of, I guess, rope. Um from the fan base and you know what he burned through it and and we and the fans turned on him because he made a series of bad decisions but these decisions like as much as the team is not performing up to i don't know as what the fan base would want none of the acquisitions are the reason the team is failing and I think that's, no, like when that's you, huge. When you've got Aginla having one goal through ten games, that's kind of an issue. Why don't we address that? Because I think that's what everyone's waiting for, everyone that's listening to this. So the captain is ten games in, and he's got six points with only one goal to his name. I don't want to be the one to start the uh, Trey Jerome parade. I will. No. Well, maybe. Go ahead. But uh, what do you guys think? Do We obviously need more from the captain. Do you think it's something we can get? Do you think there's something that they can do to turn him on and spark him? Honestly, he's always been a slow starter, so it's not really shocking that he's starting slow. It's just disappointing because there's only 48 games instead of 82. But as for the trade talk, it... it if he's not signed by April 3rd, the Flames really should trade him, even though, you know, that might not be a popular move. He is... Th this is not a slow start. This, t to me, this is... This is very different. Um, this is a guy who... You know what, for every positive move the Flames have made, Hoodler, Savanka, Weidman, the drafting, which the last two drafts I think have been incredible for this team, and when we look back in five or ten years, this those drafts are going to be looked at as a real turning point for the franchise. But that doesn't help Jerome McGinley. Jerome McGinley is 35 years old. He's going to be 36 at the end of the year. Um, he needs his window to win a Stanley Cup is closing and as much as the organization is in good shape or better shape than when Daryl Sutter uh, left um, it, it, he has to realize like he has to see that this team is not going to be the one that gets him over the hump and he also shouldn't be um, waiting around for another two three years to when Goudreau and Berchi and Jankowski are all contributing at high levels because it's probably not going to be that quick for those guys. And honestly, as much as we'd all love to keep Jerome, it is both irresponsible and selfish of the Flames and us as fans to want to keep him. Um, he is... He's a, he's, he looks mentally exhausted, and he's also, you know, he's running out there 21 minutes a night, but... Has Jerome McGinley thus far deserved 21 minutes a night? Like, be, be, looking beyond the score sheet, has his actual play, his generation of chances, his even his ability to receive... I have never seen more plays die on Jerome McGinley's stick than I have in the first 10 games of this year. Can't argue with you. 
You know, I, I've been doing a lot of thinking, though, about Jerome, and you guys tell me what you think of this, but I think part of the... I want to find the right word here. The animosity of the crowd to Jerome is they're expecting Jerome to be a certain type of player and he's not living up to it. And I'm thinking, do you think it's almost irresponsible in a way for Jerome to have not adapted his game, to realize he has shortcomings as he's gotten older, and to change his play style to, you know, adapt to his changes in his play and to, you know, for the coaching staff not to realize that as well and to not play him for 21 minutes a night. Like, to me, that's not by itself a, oh, well, he can't play 21 minutes a night. Well, you're right. So let's get somebody else who can and give Jerome a reduced role because I don't think that flipping Jerome is going to get us that piece that we need. No, but it's it's not about getting a... It's, it's not about trading Jerome for Jerome's replacement. You you trade Jerome because you are, you get value for an asset and it's the right thing to do. And as long as he is on the team, you are always going to have that attitude of, Oh, he's the guy. He's the captain. He's, you know, he's Superman. But again, this is this is not a personal thing. This is a hockey decision and unless we somehow manage to have to to parachute in three very good NHL centers and a couple good wingers to take to actually take pressure off of him and not just, you know, get him guys to play with. Um it, the the song is going to be the same, and ultimately, the goal of the Calgary Flames is not to get Jerome McGinley to be a point per game player with thirty goals and you know seventy eighty points, and to you know cement his Hall of Fame case. The goal of the Calgary Flames is to win a Stanley Cup, and I think the the it, it's not it's not been irresponsible of Jerome because Jerome's play has changed. I think it's odd that. So many people still expect a 35-year-old Aginla to be the 27-year-old who was fighting Vincent LeCavalier in the Stanley Cup Finals. That's a good point. Um, the other, I mean, the whole thing that we're talking about when you're saying that, you know, it, it's irresponsible to not move Jerome, this whole thing hinges on Jerome having a no-movement clause and him being willing to wave. And we don't know where he's willing to wave it to and if we can get deals done with that short list of teams either. Well, I'm sure that if he is willing to waive his no-trade clause, that he would likely waive it to anybody who's got a legitimate chance of winning a cup, whether that's Pittsburgh, Detroit, Chicago, San Jose, you name it. As for uh, what you would get in return, likely from similar players that have been traded, you'd get uh, B player and a first round pick and maybe a second round pick and you know none of those things are really going to turn into a replacement but the fact that you're freeing up seven million dollars in cap space that you if your ownership group is committed to spending you can parlay that into another asset as well as the actual return if the price for Paul Gostad was a first-round pick, that kind of tells you what Iggy might be worth on the open market. Yeah, for sure. Iginla is at least worth, you know, a first, probably, I would say, first top three prospect and some sort of cap dump. Um, but, I mean, r- r- ask yourself this question. Would you rather have Jerome Iginla at $6 million or $5 million or whatever his extension would be worth... Or would you rather go out and spend seven, six and a half, seven, eight million dollars on uh, Corey Perry or Ryan Getzlaff? Oh, definitely, without question, Perry or Getzlaff, just due to their age and that you can hold them for a lot longer. Exactly. So I mean, it's and it, it remains to be seen whether or not those guys will actually come available. And hedging your bets that on free agency, I don't think is necessarily the best way to go to a team or to build a team, but. I mean, it's out it, there. it is, and you can't expect him, Jerome, Jerome, to stick around because just look at the guy. He he, well, he doesn't look well, happy, does he? No. And plus, like, if you're looking at past free agent signings, like, who would have thought that Minnesota would sign Parise and Suter? You know, 
that would have probably been in the bottom five of the teams that I would have thought those two would have went to. So it's not necessarily representative of yeah, Ex- exactly. the caliber we, of team either. And we could do that without crippling ourselves with a thirteen with two 13-year contracts. Well, and that's my worries. Every year, at the, the last couple of years anyways, when we've gone to July 1st, we're getting these guys that aren't signing July 1st, but are signing a couple days later, and they're just getting crazy contracts, too long, too expensive, and as much as I love to see the Flames go out and get somebody like a Getzlaff, I don't want to see them overpay or have way too long of a term on it either. So there is a catch-22 there. Well, you can only sign guys, I believe it's either eight or seven or eight years under this new CBA if they're not your player. Well, so yeah, it's uh, seven for your for UFA, but the thing is that uh, there is a way around that by signing a guy to a one-year deal and then an additional seven. So okay. technically, you can, but technically, you can sign anybody for eight. But either way, you're still, you know, and I don't I don't know who's actually going to risk that that that's a loophole if the player agreed to it but what player is going to be like yeah i'm gonna jeopardize that 50 million dollar contract or whatever just for that extra year it's a loophole but it's not one that i think many teams would be willing to or many players would be willing to uh, explore i'm sure teams would be all for it because then if the guy busts in his first year you can be like sorry dude you had 60 points in 82 games, so uh, you're uh, you're not getting that uh, 50 million that we just talked about. So, guys, back in the first episode, we had discussed quite in length and in depth about where the Flames were, where we thought they were going to end up the season, and really, if you look at where they're sitting right now in uh, second last place, t- I guess tied for last place in the Western Conference. Uh, we're not too far out where analysts like TSN predicted that we would be, but the three of us set a deadline of the 14th of February as kind of a drop-dead date to see if this team is moving up and making progress towards progressing to 8th, or if they're simply stagnant and doing nothing. We're one game away from that deadline. We have the Stars coming on Wednesday, the 13th. How do you guys think the Flames are doing? Do you think they're going to progress towards that and actually make the playoffs or make a run for it? Or should they just assume that uh, they're done? I don't think there's any way that this team makes the playoffs, but I I didn't expect them to, and I don't need them to. I just need them to get better and organizationally strengthen their position so that when they're, you know, when in two or three years, three or four years maybe, when all of their prospects kind of all their top end guys kind of come into their own you know we're set up to be successful then i mean whether we like it or not the rebuild has already kind of happened we've just got a very veteran laden team um and i don't know that uh there's no acquisition we can make that's going to put us over the top our starting goalie is out and the captain could be traded you know, in the next six weeks. So playoffs, like I, I'm more interested to see individual players develop than I am to actually see this team make a real playoff push. Well, I think organizationally the Flames are committed to trying to win and trying to make the playoffs. And while they're probably about three or four points behind where I think would have liked them to be they're still gonna keep pushing and you know like Glenn Cross, Tange and again love all kind of sucked thus far this season so if they can pick it up and actually start playing like they normally do you might actually start seeing them progress towards being a playoff team I don't think they'll make it and you know I hope Feaster towards the trade deadline if they are out of it that they actually do blow up the team but yeah it's a wait, still a wait and see because there have been little flashes of good play along with flashes of oh boy <laughs> isn't that what you expect from a team that's gonna probably draft in the top five yeah pretty much remember now though that any team who doesn't make the playoffs can get number one the draft lottery's gone 
Yeah, but still, the top, uh, well, the worst teams still have a very large percentage, so. We're, we're going to be right in the, I think, in the middle of that, you know, top five mix, and I, I'm honestly, I would, as much as it would be great to see a Nathan McKinnon in Flaming Seas next year, I'm almost, you know, I'm such a poor decision maker uh, that I would rather almost see us end up with, like, second. So that way, you know, that big, you know, Jones or McKinnon sort of debate, that decision gets made for us, and then we just take the other one. Um, but, I mean, any of the top four of uh, McKinnon, Jones, Barkov, or Drouin is, I would say, going to, you know, help this franchise by leaps and bounds. So I'm not going to be upset with any of them. Yeah, with the draft, uh, it seems that this year there's 10 really above-average prospects, and then it just tails off. So really, anywhere in the top 10, I would be perfectly fine with any of them. So, you know, and especially considering that it's mostly centers and defensemen, the two areas that we're lacking greatly. So, you know, if... I would hope that they are in that range. <laughs> okay, if you get number one overall, who are you taking? Nathan McKinnon. I wouldn't take Seth Jones at all, and I wouldn't take any of the other defensemen in the first round. If you had the first overall pick, would you consider dealing it? Yes. No. I would too. There really isn't much of a step down from McKinnon to Drouin to Barkoff or even Lindholm. It, they're all good, so you know if you can get a second round pick or an additional first round pick, you know it depends really. But you know the, the options are there. You gotta weigh it at the time. You know we, you were talking earlier, Matt, about how this team seems still committed to being a playoff team, making a playoff push, and I think we're a big hockey market and. That's expected in this town, so I think a lot of that is um, what has to be said by this organization in order for people not to lose their jobs and fans not to lose their patience. I agree with what Lucas was saying, that I'm liking this year seeing players develop, and I'm enjoying seeing these young guys like Berchi, like, uh, you know, Cervanka, guys like that who are young players and seeing them progress. And for the first time, I don't think that the Flames' cupboards are bare for the future. When Sutter was around, I was always worried what would happen if we did need to blow the thing up. But I think this year, if we're out of the playoffs, you don't need to blow the thing up. You can make some some changes, maybe move some veterans, but I think this team is okay going forward. They might not be a playoff team next year, but I think you can still be within that fight within the next two to three years without totally blowing it up just by changing a couple pieces, playing your cards right on UFA day. And again, if we get a number one pick by some stroke of luck, it'd be the Flames' highest pick ever. I'd be okay to deal down anywhere in the top five if it would bring us a good return. Keep in mind, though, that I don't think, I don't like any organization that doesn't at least try to win. I mean, if you, I mean, the cap floor is what, 40 some million dollars? So you're, you're going to be putting a no matter what you're going to be putting a decent team on the ice and ultimately like the, i think the reason besides the fact that there are rivals that so many people are pissed off at the oilers is because they looked like they tanked on purpose if you're trying to be good and you just suck that's not anyone's fault really you just it is what it is you don't have the talent but when you're like oh no we're we're not really going to we're not really going to try because we we saw what Pittsburgh and Washington did, and we'd really like to have that happen to us. So we're just going to mail it in for a little bit and completely excuse all organizational incompetencies for the next three to five years because we have delusions that uh, our three first overall picks are uh, Crosby, Malkin, and Stahl. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and uh, one other thing. The reason I would take uh, McKinnon first overall is simply, and again, I'm horrible at making decisions, is simply that I wouldn't want to be in a St. Louis situation where they take Eric Johnson and then have to watch their division rival take Jonathan Taves and 
how's that going to taste for the next 18 years? It's not going to taste good. It's going to be awful. No, but that could have gone the other way around, too. Yeah, because Eric Johnson could have easily developed into Chris Pronger. So. But, but he didn't. When he was, yeah, when he was drafted. I, but you you don't know that, right? I mean, it's like when we drafted Kid over Brodeur. It's always hindsight's twenty twenty. So we could draft either guy and we could win or lose. Who knows? Sort of. But what's, what's the more valuable position, center or defense? And uh, as I say this, look at every defenseman who signed a monster contract in the last two or three years and look at the way they've played after signing said monster contracts. Oh yeah. Well, definitely a center is vastly more important just because <sighs> it's hard to find a good center as we've seen since new and Dyke. <laughs> so, you know, somebody once told me you draft your forwards and you bring in your defenseman through trade and, unrestricted free agency so but going by that logic you'd probably want to draft the centerman exactly I mean, yeah well like it, and especially like with the flames right now like they got bowmeister giordano weidman and tj brody here for like the next five years well bowmeister less but you know like there's not really an onus to get another top guy in the organization so yeah, whereas on the forward group, they're all older, the good ones anyway. So, you know, you got a little bit more of a pressing need of someone to actually replace those guys. Chris Pronger has been traded, who's arguably the second best defenseman of the last 20 years behind Lidstrom, was traded from St. Louis to Edmonton, Edmonton to Anaheim, Anaheim to Philly. Like, and Hartford to yes, St. Hartford, Louis Hartford, as well. I forgot about that. So he was traded four times. Quite the historian, Matt. But well, that's my degree. It's got to be useful for something. Um, but Zdeno Chara came to Boston via free agency. Scott Niedemeyer goes to Anaheim, free agent. Defensemen are always coming available. And Ryan Suter, do you really want, as after seeing him last night, no knock on him as a player, do you want to be paying Ryan Suter $98 million over the next 13 years? No. No. Nope. <laughs> By the time someone who has a okay, look, think of it this way. By the time Ryan Suter's contract is over, someone with a newborn baby, that baby is going to have figured out some things about sex, <laughs> if not everything. <laughs> why do you want the places a, your mind why goes do you, sometimes? Why do you want a hockey player for that long? <laughs> That was a little bit of a weird tangent. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to say. Your mind goes some weird places sometimes, Lucas. Okay. Oh, do you want? I, I have one more, by the way, and it's a it's so it uh, relates to again and it being irresponsible and selfish to not trade him. Lucky us, Matt. Indeed, and yep. lucky all of you people listening. Okay. Basically, think of the Flames as a sixteen-year-old high school dropout who's pregnant. Kicked out of her parents' house, boyfriend dumped her, and they've made the she's made the decision to keep the baby. Why? Why would you keep that baby? You cannot possibly hope to provide the life that a nice gay couple in their thirties could could provide it. So, what what's your deal? It it it's a selfish thing to do. Give the kid up, trade Jerome McGinley, just let everyone be happy. <laughs> the kid doesn't have a no trade clause, nor is the kid wearing a C on its chest. Those two things complicated. <laughs> he said oh. he'd move. He said he'd waive his no trade clause in this summer. I don't think that's that big an issue. He came to Jerome and said, "Hey, yeah. uh, New York really wants you." Uh, you get to go play with on a line with Nash and Richards. Uh, he'd be like, oh, yeah, okay, thank you, goodbye. Um, anything else you guys want to discuss before we go? Nah, I'm good. You didn't want to end on that? We can, I just want to make sure nobody else had anything else to discuss. Oh, no, we're good. We're at, uh, we're at 45 good. minutes, we're not this interesting. We may not be, the team might be, though. Oh, that's a stretch. <laughs> 
All right. Hey, After the, last the game, worst... yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if nobody has anything else to discuss, then uh, let's. I have one thing. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I have two new Twitter followers. I'm up to eighty. So let's see if we can't get to eighty-three by next week. And who are those two? I don't know. I'm not. I. I. I I just noticed that I had more followers than uh, I remember having. So, was it me and Matt? No, it wasn't. It was other yeah. people. I, I was I was oh, I was wow. hovering around I think seventy six, and now I'm at eighty. So, and Matt, That's you're good. on Twitter now too. Do you want to promote your Twitter handle? Uh, at Cage Great. So you probably need the followers more than Lucas does because you probably have none. Yeah, I don't really care either way. <laughs> Keep in mind, at least 20 of my um, followers are Russian webcam girls. And I just have... What you do in your own times, your no, own no, business. No, no, they, right? they follow me. I don't follow them. It's just, uh, I, I just don't have the... I, I don't have enough followers to justify unfriending them. Or not unfriending them, blocking them. So I figure eyes are eyes, right? Even if they're up here. Whatever works for you. Anyway, I'm at uh, I'm at Luke seventeen oh one L U C one seven zero one. And if you forget those numbers, if you're listening to this in the car or in the at the gym and you go, What was those numbers after Luke? You can always go to firesidechat.ca and in the sidebar there's a link to each one of our Twitter profiles so you can follow us from there. Powerful. Oh, also, if you're ever watching Star Trek and you see the Enterprise and you notice, huh, that looks familiar. Yes, the last four digits of the Enterprise's serial number, 1701. That's what the Twitter's about. Ah, big reveal. Live long and prosper. <laughs> Atta boy, Matty. All right, gentlemen, it's been an interesting week for the Flames, and I hope that the next week there's a lot of games coming up. Uh, that we'll at least know by this time next week if this team is on the upward sl- slope or on a downward slope and how they're going to go from here on in. Make sure you check out firesidechat.ca for all the links you need. And that's it for us for this week. For the third time, suck it, Tom. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. Theme music, Take the Lead, by Kevin McLeod.